بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise is due to Allah We send salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم His household and the righteous companions الحمد لله So before we start as we should always do. We will start with the blessed intentions and Alhamdulillah, if the sisters, if they're comfortable with it, please, uh, there's a side that is appropriated for you all uh, because this class is a uh, interactive class. So if you want to, if you like, please come over and join us uh, because we will ask questions as we go along, inshallah. But before we start, um, we will uh, start with the intentions, inshallah. As we are always encouraged to be very intentional in what it is that we do uh, before any action it is. So I will say those in Arabic first and then we will uh, translate them into English, inshallah, and then we'll get started with our program. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla wa anta ya hayu ya qayyum Taj'alu al-hazana idha shidta sahlan sahla سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يقربنا إليك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين يا فتاح يا عليم افتح لنا فتحا قريبا يا فتاح يا عليم افتح لنا فتحا قريبا يا فتاح يا عليم افتح لنا فتحا قريبا اللهم اغننا بالعلم وزينا بالحلم واكرمنا بالتقوى وجملنا بالعافية يا ارحم الراحمين نويت التعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة وحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله والدعاء إلى الهدى والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى O oh Allah, nothing is easy except that which you make easy and you are the ever-living, the self-subsisting. You make that which is distressing the easiest of easy if you want to, O oh Allah. So make things easy for us. All glory be to you with no faults attributed to you, O oh Allah, and there is no knowledge with us except that which you have given us. Truly, you are the all-knowing, the all-wise. O oh, nurturer, expand our chests with understanding and make easy our affair and please untie the knots from our tongues and please strengthen our speech so that we may understand one another. O oh Allah, teach us that which will benefit us and benefit us by that which you've taught us and increase us in knowledge and actions that will draw us closer to you by your mercy, O oh, most merciful of those who are merciful. O oh, opener, O oh, all-knowing, grant us a speedy opening. O oh, opener, O oh, all-knowing, grant us a speedy opening. O oh, opener, O oh, all-knowing, grant us a speedy opening. O oh, Allah, enrich us with knowledge and adorn us with wisdom and honor us with consciousness of you and beautify us with piety. O oh, Allah, we intend to learn and to teach and to be reminded and to remind and to be benefited and to benefit and to be of use and to take advantage of this opportunity by your mercy, O oh, most merciful of those who are merciful. All of that by holding and grasping the book of Allah, the glorious Quran, and the living ways of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All while pointing others and ourselves toward goodness and seeking and desiring the countenance of Allah, his pleasure, his nearness, his reward, 
for truly he is without flaw and he is the highest. So today's class will be, inshallah, on the boastful gardener. And even though this is now Saturday night um, with the lunar calendar, um, Friday is a beautiful day and we're encouraged by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to read Surah Al-Kahf. And Surah Al-Kahf, the more and more that you read it, and we're told to read it on Friday as it has special attributes that um, it'll protect you from the uh, harm of Ad-Dajjal. These are one of the protections. Another one is that if you read the first 10 ayats of Surah Al-Kahf, in the last 10, that there is a protection that comes over you and a light that will be and emanate from you all the way up to the highest heavens from uh, Friday to Friday. And it's good to keep that up. So basically you're recognized inside of al ghaib right? And especially amongst the angels because there's this purified light that's always emanating from you when we read Surah Al-Kaf speci specifically on Fridays. So it's very, Allah gives us things to really connect and give us reason to connect with this surah because there's many jewels within it which everything of the glorious Quran is a jewel. And so just to give some context regarding the story, uh, it's pretty simple. We'll see that there's two archetypes, uh, two types of characters. And generally, these are the, ty uh, the typical characters that Allah um, has put on this earth. And some of these characteristic flaws uh, may be within our character. And alhamdulillah that we are given this Quran uh, and that we read it because we become more conscious of ourselves, our actions, our words. And then there's another archetype of character inside of this glorious story um, that we can also resonate with. And, and Allah shows us the type of character that he actually wants us to be um, as compared to the other. And there are many things we'll get to pick up as we um, will recite some Quran. And then we'll talk about some of the verses uh, in the middle of that. So if anyone wants to raise their hand, please, this is an open floor the whole time. So don't feel like you're disrupting or anything. Uh, if there's any aha moments, any light bulb moments that comes to you and you want to share something, please do. Because as we said in our uh, intentions, we are here to teach and to be taught. OK, so we're all sitting here learning with one another. And when you... Uh, bring your thoughts or you bring your questions, you actually help the rest of the group because someone may have been shy and didn't want to share something or something may have not been thought about and you might bring a new insight uh, to the group, inshallah. So therefore we can benefit. And if anybody was present for the khutbah today, we spoke about uh, 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 gatherings of remembrance. And so what is extremely beautiful about this gathering right now is even if you read this surah today, you have light upon light because when you sit in a gathering amongst one another, and you remember Allah, Allah has angels that go inside of all the paths of the earth seeking for those who are remembering Allah as a group. And so we'll be mentioned among those people. And many things happens within that, uh, this conversation that goes on between Allah and his angels. And so we'll be, we come with all of our needs. So also have an intention to have your needs fulfilled while being here. Allah knows what is inside of your hearts and what it is that you're going through or the people that you care for and that you make dua for. So bring that to these gatherings and bring those intentions to uh, have those answered by Allah. Because you're connecting with his glorious Quran, you're remembering him and uh, connecting with his Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so we'll begin. Allah um, advises or he tells the Prophet Muhammad, Ba'da a'udhu billahi min shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. وَاضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلَ الرَّجُلَيْنِ جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِهِمَا جَنَّتَيْنِ مِنْ أَعْنَابٍ وَحَفَثْنَاهُمَا بِنَخْلٍ وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمَا زَرْعًا Allah tells the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to give them the example, give the believers an example of two men. And one of the two men, Allah gave him, more so the boastful gardener, he gave him two illustrious gardens. 
Now, these illustrious gardens were made up of date palms, as Allah uh, describes. Uh, these were two gardens, uh, and uh, they were surrounded by grapevines. And Allah also, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me, surrounded them with uh, date palm trees, and he put in between them uh, produce, th uh, vegetation which would produce abundantly. So you can imagine these two beautiful types of gardens, right? If they're surrounded by grapevines, imagine how beautiful this is. Like maybe if you ever take a uh, spin and drove up around Napa or whatever the case is, right? You see all these beautiful grapevines that are intertwined and it's a big land. And so this man had two gardens at that. And continuing, Allah further describes these two gardens saying, and so Allah continues to describe these illustrious gardens saying that those two gardens, they produce their fruit, their forth abundantly, and it didn't fall short in anything that it produced. So if you can ever remember a time that you had a piece of fruit, or any type of vegetable, and it was probably the uh, imagine a peach or strawberries or whatever the case is. It's the sweetest of sweet, and they're big and fruitful and and very divine. Allah is the one who blessed these gardens and said that they didn't fall short in any of it. And so this man was also able to feed many people from his garden, and he had big business that came from these gardens as well. And also, uh, also Allah describes now, if we learn, I took a little class regarding permaculture, what is uh, permanent agriculture. And so we get to know more about the earth and how it works. And so Allah also describes inside of this glorious Quran and uh, these two gardens that he also produced a river that came up in between the bo both of them. So also people had a means of water, a water source, and also the vegetation and the plants and the trees were always uh, satisfied from a point of uh, nutrition and able to grow because of this water supply that was there. So you need water, obviously, in order to produce a garden. And so Allah allowed the water to produce from those gardens as well. And Allah also says uh, with it uh, was many fruits, but also I looked in the tafsir and it describes of how much um, uh, wealth that this man had amassed from having these two gardens. All right, so fruits can be little fruit that we eat, grapes, dates, uh, oranges, etc. But also the fruit that he got from it, from his sustenance, uh, and able to provide and to make money off of it as well. So now let's listen to what this man with the two gardens said um, when he's speaking with his friend. Now this friend who he's with is the more level-headed, and we'll say the Muslim brother. Um, some of in some of the tafsir, they say that this boastful gardener actually was some say he was a disbelieving person, but we'll get to see going forth. But what we want to do is put this into a perspective um, of ourselves today. We want to really associate these characters with ourselves and see uh, maybe if we have some characteristics of the boastful gardener and uh, if we have characteristics of the Muslim man. And see how can we get ourselves more in tune with the Muslim brother, inshallah. Continuing. فَقَالَ لِصَاحِبِهِ وَهُوَ يُحَاوِرُهُ أَنَا أَكْثَرُ مِنْكَ مَالًا وَأَعَزُّ نَفَرًا So now the man with these two illustrious gardens, he decides to boast to his friend. And he tells him, on the account of my two beautiful gardens and everything that is in it, I have more money than you and I have a bigger group who follows me, who is with me, and I have more children than you. Is what he says to his friend who doesn't have as much, meaning the Muslim man. And Allah continues and he says, وَدَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ وَهُوَ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ قَالَ مَا أَذُنُّ أَنْ تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ أَبَدًا 
وما أظن الساعة قائمة ولا إرددت إلى ربي لا أجدن خيرا منها منقلبا. And we must pay very much attention to this because one thing that we learn that Allah does not like oppression. And one thing that we can reflect about specifically, let's just take a break real quick before we finish our verses, but Allah doesn't like oppression. And when we think about what is oppression and why wouldn't Allah like oppression is because firstly, we are the creation of Allah. And only Allah is able to do with his creation that what it is that he wants to do with his creation. And it is not up for anyone else to force Allah's creation to do something that is not within their right to do. And so you can imagine when Allah says that this man entered the garden, he oppressed himself. Now, how many times do we sit and we think about the sins that we may commit and how often are we actually oppressing our own selves? And so we must take heed into these verses and understand and look at it from a lens that it's not only just, well, we can reflect on what did this man do? Firstly, this man, he boasted. It is not up for the human creation to boast about anything because the only reason why you have anything to boast about is because Allah ultimately gave it to you. No matter the means, if someone comes right, right now to you and gives you a million dollars, and you were to boast to someone else about that. The only reason why you got that is because Allah blessed someone else to give them that money to be able to give it to you. As everything comes from Allah, no matter who it comes from. Ultimately, if you reduce the fraction, you will always get down to one. And that one is Allah. And so Allah is the one who provided this man with these gardens. So Allah says when he boasted to his friend as if he is the one who created these grapevines, as, as if he is the one who makes it produce forth um, all of his goodness, all the fruit that it bears, as if he is the one who made water and allowed it to come from this space. He just happens to be an owner of it and, in, and is in charge of it and is supposed to manage it the correct way. But he decides to be boastful and tell someone about things that he has. And then he lets the brother know who he's speaking to that he doesn't have any of these things. And so how he, he's not on his level, basically. Right. And so listen to what the man said was being oppressive to himself. Furthermore, how he oppressed himself. So Allah says when he entered his gardens, so he says, to his friend, the Muslim brother, and I don't think that any of this, any of this will ever go away, right? We have this dream of living on this earth forever, especially when it's something that inclines to our nefs, to our desires. He, he is clinging on to something, and so he is extremely hopeful because he sees how much he is surmounting from his garden. So he says, I don't think this will ever die. I don't think this will, I will ever lose any of this. And also, he continues and he says, so look at the arrogance that he also has. When he tells the Muslim man, he says, and I don't think the hour will ever be established. So this is why also in the tafsir they show and say that he was a disbelieving man because he says, and I don't believe in Yom Al-Qiyam. I don't believe that there's this day that, oh, God is going to bring us all together and that we're going to have to stand before him in however way that we stand and that we're going to be judged based off of what we've done. But as Muslims, we know that this is the case. OK, and so on top of his arrogance of already denying that he don't think that this will ever end and also that he doesn't believe in the day of judgment. We hear people who speak like this as well today. And he says you know what? Even if let's just say if there were to be a day of judgment, he says, then I will return. I will return back to my Lord. And I'm sure that I will find much more better than these two gardens in exchange when I go back to him. So imagine that a person who abuses on this land, who denies that Yomu Kiyama is true, a person who 
uh, feels as if they are the one who made their success come about their, by their own means. And then he also decides to say that he doesn't believe in the last day. But yet, if he were to go back to his Lord, and if his Lord was real, then he would definitely have even better than what he had in life. So, right, this is like um, some people, when a famous song came out, uh, they would say YOLO, right? You only live once. And so I'm going to take the best of this life. And these are how some other believers believe as well. And they're tricked. They say they feel like they can say a certain word. And then that means that they're saved. So now they can go out in the streets and do whatever it is that they want to and commit whatever atrocities and whatever sins that they want to. As long as they believe by saying some word, then they'll also be saved in their akhirah. But we know that that, that isn't the case. Even us as Muslims, we stand between two wings, the wings of fear and the wings of hope with Allah, because we do our best to try and strive and to be a proper Muslim, to submit ourselves to Allah, even though we have our shortcomings. So we fear that we will be tried and tested in the sense that Allah will make us stand before and answer all the things that we do, that we've done wrong. And that's Allah has salam and wa'afiyah. Say ameen. I mean, we seek Allah's protection from having to stand before him, actually. We actually ask that Allah allows us to stand underneath his arsh on Yom Al-Qiyamah and that we don't have to face any hisab, any type of judgment. Say, I mean, I mean. And so, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Uh, so, following this thought, uh, we know the reality of what things are. And we're talking about those two wings. But we're also hopeful that, yes, we, sh- we say... نَشَهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَنَشَهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ We also say that we are Muslim and we bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship and that the Prophet Muhammad is his last messenger and servant. So we're between these two wings. And one thing that we can always remind ourselves about being on these two wings, which is extremely beautiful, is why? Why should we be... Uh, in a constant state of between fear and hope with Allah. It's because it'll always keep you balanced, right? If you have too much fear of Allah, you may cripple yourself to where you can't even perform and you may become arrogant in whatever it is that you're doing in life and feel like you're the one who's making things happen even though it's for him, it's, 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 it's Allah alone. And also there's another arrogance you can have in uh, believing that because you're on the quote-unquote right team, because you're a Muslim, that everything is all good and that you're saved. And so now you don't even try hard uh, in your worldly affairs to conduct yourself in a correct way and better yourself because you think that because you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, right? You feel as if you're already saved and protected. So these are a beautiful type of analogy for us to always remember in this being between fear and hope. And this is what Allah also shows us that resonates inside of Surah Al-Fatiha um, and many other times, even in the characteristics of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, We see that everything is always drawing us to the middle. Firstly, we're not the, the group or believers who associate partners with Allah, nor do we stick to scripture in a sense to where we uh, only we take things solely literally. Right. And then earn the wrath of Allah. And so, um, alhamdulillah, forgive me, I got a, a little bit distracted. But what I'm getting at is that it's important to always be balanced. And this were, these were the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We always have like this reflection, this mirror. If you look at the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he is described as not being very tall, nor was he short. Right? His hair wasn't necessarily very curly, nor was it straight. Right. There's a lot of things that we see that always draws us to being as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be, a, uh, peace be upon him, told us to be is the middle nation. Right. Because everything with balance is where you'll find success. And one more thing to just point out about all of these things that happen in the middle and always reminding us, they say we live about five lives. Correct. They say that there's the uh, realm of the arwah of the souls. And which we uh, bore witness and testified that there is no God but God and that uh, we wanted to be these human beings when we took uh, essentially a contract with Allah. Secondly, there's the life inside of the womb, 
right? There's this another life that we lived inside of our mother's wombs. May Allah bless them all. Um, that we also lived, and there were certain experiences that we had gone through. And then three, right out of the five, if you look at my hand, right, we're on the third life. You and I, how we're speaking right now, we're in that life. And where is that one? That's the middle life, because then you have al-barzaq afterwards, right? That's the, the realm of the waiting period. And then you have either paradise or its opposite. And we ask Allah's protection from his opposite. We ask Allah to grant us jannat al-firdaus. So if you see, everything aligns with being in the middle. Everything about how the human being should be is about trying to find ourselves in the middle. And sorry to make that tangent, but I think some of these things and these beautiful reflections are really good in order for us to know how it is that we should be whenever we're judging ourselves of how to get back right with anything. Whether that's a relationship in our homes, with our spouse, with our children, uh, looking at our role. Us as fathers, how are we implementing rule in our house? How are we implementing schedules, right? How uh, for Ramadan do we set up things so we don't burn out? Um, how is it uh, with our warships, right? And so we're just taking things steadily and trying to be uh, paceful within that. And so to get back to the story and just to remind you guys, forgive me. Um, and I did say that this will be kind of like an interactive as well. And I know that I've just been speaking the whole time. But is there anything that anybody would like to share or to kind of point out while we're in the middle of our story? Anything that anyone wants to share? Any reflections? Or... Okay. So we'll continue, inshallah. Are you guys with me? I'm not boring you guys to death, am I? I hope not. And you guys can speak up. We're all brothers and sisters inside of here, okay? And this is the safest of safe spaces. Um, I don't want to just be up here also rambling at all, okay? I want to make sure that you guys are benefiting and that you guys are feeling something uh, from this because this is all for the sake of Allah and for us to become better Muslims inshallah so please feel free to share at any point in time and so again so now we were back to when this boastful gardener or a uh, man who owns a garden uh, told his friend all of these things that he doesn't believe that Yom Qiyamah will start and even if he did um, he will return back to his Lord and a beautiful thing about the Arabic, he says, La ajidanna, which is the lamb of Tawqeed and the noon of Tawqeed. So there's a double emphasis on this. And as we will say, it's like, um, it's like saying, for sure, for sure, for sure. Like, I'm, I'm definitely, he's saying, like, I'm definitely going to receive something better than this, even if I were to return back to my Lord. Right. So he's saying for show, sure, like I, I got this in the bag, as the youth was saying. And so um, now let's listen to the more better and level headed side of how and Allah shows us uh, of how he wants us to respond. If we are having conversations like this, if um, we're trying to help guide our brother or sister who may be talking boastfully or even for our own selves. قال له صاحبه وهو يحاوره أكفرت بالذي خلقك من تراب ثم من نطفة ثم سواك رجلا لكن هو الله ربي ولا أشرك بربي أحدا. And so the level-headed Muslim believing brother he says to his friend he tries to bring him back he tries to have him basically do toba toba is like making a u-turn on the street if you were getting off of an exit you got off the wrong one you get back on right it's a tab yatubu it's like you're coming back he's trying to direct him back to allah and this is the point of toba for allah is the most gracious the most merciful right allah is the all forgiving al ghafur whenever we make a mistake it's okay in a sense that we can always return back to Allah. We turn back to Allah and correct ourselves and try to stay from making that mistake. And so the level-headed brother, he tells him, أَكَفَرْتَ بِالَّذِي خَلَقَكَ مِن تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ مِن نُطُفَةٍ ثُمَّ سَوَّاكَ رَجُلًا A beautiful way of how to articulate to someone and to bring them back without being so harsh with them. So he tells him, Brother, do you think about the one who created you? Do you think about the one 
who brought you from dirt. And he's referring to our father Adam, alayhi salam. The one who created you out of something that all of us walks on. He created you out of dirt, then from a drop. And this drop is a, a, um, a, a place where every single one of us once were. And this is that, that drop that was clinging to the womb of our mothers. And how we eventually started to grow. Then he says, Thumma sawaka rajula. And so you grew and cells of you multiplied and then you were fleshed and clothed. It was bone, you were given bones and those were flesh and clothed. Right? And Allah gave you a brain and all of your organs and everything that you need in order to function. And then you were a baby. You were born. And then you grew from a weak state to a stronger state. Do you not think about the one who actually created you? So what about the gardens? He is the one who created all of this. You're simply a driver of a vessel, of a vehicle. And you're put in charge of that thing and you're made to take care of it. You're not the one who created anything. So for you and I, my dear brothers and sisters, anything it is that we have, specifically being here in America, we feel like this is mine. This is my house. This is my, these are my kids. This is my car. This is mine. 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 Right? And sometimes it's my, my, my tricks us. And then it will allow us to have a certain attitude as if we have a certain type of dominion or kingdom over that thing. Now, it's okay to say if something is yours. For rightly, Allah tells us to take care of our possessions. So they are ours. But how do we actually perceive those things? And what is our relationship with those things? And how do we actually juxtapose ourselves? Right? Like we can say that this is our earth. But Allah says that he sent us right as a khalifa, as a vicegerent, as someone to take care of the earth. So all of the roles and responsibilities that we have, whether we're a father, a mother, brother, sister, a manager at some place, uh, whatever job it is, we are to be taking care of that thing. And that's why we are responsible, because we will have to be able to provide a response. Right? What's the point of Yom Qiyama, of being asked about anything, even if we are given that chance? The point of being asked something is because you are responsible for something. Therefore, you must and we must provide an adequate response. And that's what Allah has given us kingship or some type of management over something to see how did we fare within managing that thing. So being a father, mother, uh, an owner of anything is righteously taking care of something. Yes, you had a question? Oh, here's the uh, here's the microphone for you, right behind you. Is it? Uh... <laughs> Now, what's going on over there? Okay. Um, it's not working? Okay. Oh. If it... Okay, no problem. You can go ahead and ask your question. I'll uh, reiterate it for the rest of the group that's here, inshallah. What is this thing? You won't play on earth and a lot of controls. That's a, that's a really good question. So the question is, are we just like role playing on the earth and Allah is in control of everything? This is almost like a yes and no type of answer. Of course, yes, Allah is in control of everything. And Allah has written every single thing down and Allah knows the outcome of every single thing. Allah knows the beginning of every single thing. Allah knows everything about everything, okay? But it works things, the way that Allah controls his dominion, the way Allah controls and runs his kingdom is different from that which you and I experience here. Right? Like, um, Allah knows how much coffee is inside of this cup and how much of it, if it were to spill out and I, were, and I were to catch it, 
Allah knows exactly how much would have came out as compared to how much doesn't, right? And even I don't know that much. You understand? And so you still have an obligation to fulfill, to learn about Allah and to do that which is right. Even though Allah knows the outcome of what you're going to do, you still don't. Correct? It's like, um, like taking a test, for example. And many of the things, especially, and I don't want to uh, go on, prolong this too much, but I'll just say it in English. There's a hadith that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam tells us about um, intentions, for example. And for every single person who intends, that's why this deen is really based off of intentions. So, for example, when you say, okay, are we just role playing, for example, and uh, Allah is in control of everything? Yes. But let's imagine if you intended to do a good deed, right? Uh, you saw a homeless person sitting outside of some restaurant and you wanted to feed that person. You say, oh, Allah, I intend to go and feed this person. Allah knows the outcome, whether you're going to feed that person or not. Correct. So you go, you don't have any cash on you, but you go into whatever place and you go get this person some food and you come back and they're not there. Do you know what happens? You're rewarded for that. Right. But Allah knows the intention. But imagine because Allah is the one who's in control of everything. But imagine if Allah made it so much so that even if you intended, you didn't get the reward of what, uh, whatever it is that you were seeking. Right. Allah knows. And Allah made that also a test for you to be able to go through that, to recognize that he is the one who's in control of everything. But you still get rewarded for that which you intend. Right. And so, yes, uh, it's still up for you and I, even though we don't know the outcome of things, it's for us to not take on this mindset and think, well, since Allah knows that I'm going to do this and I was born to this type of family and I have this type of problem that's going on inside of my life and I can't get over this type of addic uh, addiction and these types of people are condemned and I'm not perfect, so I'm just going to give up. No. But these are some ways that people think and this is the way that they try to, uh, sometimes people, uh, the shaitan tricks people and tries to have them, them, to get them to ostracize themselves from the worship and remembrance of Allah. Allah is the most merciful. So it doesn't matter what you do in a sense that um, you did something wrong. And now the shaitan wants you to have this bad sense of yourself and that there's no return. But that's only, be, that's only predicated for him. As he made a swear that, you know, instead of seeking forgiveness from Allah, he wanted to do his best to lead us from the straight path. But us as human beings, we have um, the forgiveness of Allah, which the shaitan is rejected from. So he gets inside the people's heads to try to get them to think in this type of manner so that they don't worship Allah. And so that they just feel like, well, let me just give up because Allah already knows everything. So why even try? Right. Your Lord is merciful and wants the best for you. Alhamdulillah. Is there any more questions? We, uh, we still got a little bit more of the story to continue, inshallah. Does that, I hope that that satisfies your question. Does that help? Okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, and so the Muslim brother, again, is reminding his brother, you know, Allah is the one who created you, and Allah is the one who created all of these things, especially. And he's trying to help hint to him. So, like, bro, this is the same thing that he did in regards to your garden, right? If he created you from dirt and then from a clot and then fastened you as a human being who is walking, who is capable of doing everything that he or she is able to now. Well, what about something as simple as a garden, right? We're much more complex in the garden, even though we share many things in actuality. And so the brother, he also reminds him, he says, as for me, he is Allah, my Lord. And I do not associate any partners with Allah. Now, why is it that he said, I don't associate any partners with Allah? Does anyone know in here who this man, this boastful man associated a partner uh, with Allah? Does anybody know who, who, what that thing it was? Right. Typically, we hear from some religions, they associate a certain type of prophet to be uh, a partner of Allah. As if Allah has a, a right-hand man that he consults with, right? Uh, some people worship other gods, right? And so we would typically call this association or ship. So something else that Allah is teaching us, he says, Wala ushriku bi rabbi ahada, Meaning, 
I don't even associate myself, right, with anything. I don't attribute anything to myself because it's solely from Allah. So I don't make myself a deity either. So sometimes us as human beings, we forget that we do uh, what some people call is a minor shift, right, in associating ourselves with Allah, and sometimes we don't even recognize it from the words that we say when we convey to others. How many times have we, may we had had an argument inside of the house and said, this is mine, or I did this, I did that. How many arguments, how many people have we, have we shown that, oh, I made all of my salawat, I fasted, huh? So you start to take on this type of arrogance and the only reason and the only way you were able to do so and to fulfill anything was solely because of Allah. Allah gave you and I the tawfiq to be able to walk. Allah gave you and I the tawfiq to have limbs. Allah gave us the tawfiq to give us a voice box, to give us strength to be able to push air out of our bodies and to have a mind to, to think every single process that it takes in order uh, from a synaptic nerve to go off in your body and to happen all happened because of the will of Allah and Allah allowed it to happen So what are we really and who are we really if we are to think about it? Sometimes we forget with this little power that Allah has given us. We also make ourselves associates of Allah And we ask Allah's protection from that and for us to be able to recognize to not to never associate anything even ourselves uh, as partners with Allah and so in this reminding, the Muslim brother, he continues and he says, وَلَوْلَا إِذْ دَخَلْتَ جَنَّتَكَ قُلْتَ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ إِن تَرَنِي أَنَا أَقَلَّ مِنْكَ مَالًا وَوَلَدًا And so the Muslim brother, he says, and why isn't, I would advise you, O brother, I would advise you that when you enter into your garden, that you say, MashaAllah, it is how Allah willed. Correct? It's the way that Allah wanted it to be. So I'm grateful for what Allah has given me. Why don't, when you walk into your garden, you say, look at that beautiful spring that is in between my two gardens, which allows fruit to bear forth and produce abundantly. Why don't you say, this is how Allah uh, wants things to be. Look at the importance that Allah is showing you and I inside of his glorious Quran of how we should respond to anything. So when you get a home, when you get a car, when you get a child, it is for us to say, MashaAllah, right? Because sometimes we, we get so comfortable with ourselves. We say, look at that pretty baby. She got my eyes or she has my nose or they have this of me and they have that. And alhamdulillah, we're grateful that Allah has blessed us with something, but we should say, we should, we should say, MashaAllah, it's how Allah wanted it to be. My house is how Allah wanted it to be, and I'm appreciative of that, right? Because this remembrance will take and extract anything of association of Allah, of anything or anybody, right? And so that's the importance of the remembrance of Allah, because it helps keep us always in this middle state that we spoke about earlier. And so when you remember Allah, when you say words of righteousness, Allah, as we said also today in the khutbah, he will therefore correct your actions. So every time when something good in our lives happen, we should say, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah. Because this reminder goes off first, oh yeah, it is Allah the one who allowed it to be. I didn't have no part of it, but I, I want to show my appreciation for that thing. Even if you hit the game-winning buzzer beater, okay? Alhamdulillah, mashallah, Allah is the one who allowed it to be. Even if you cook the best uh, tandoori or whatever meal it is inside of your house, mashallah, Allah allowed all the best spices to come together. I was just a vessel who did it. Mashallah, it came out how Allah wanted it to be. And when, when I fell at something, mashallah, it's the way that Allah wanted it to be. And therefore, I won't become so much more down on what it is that I on what I couldn't make happen. Why? It's because it's Allah is the one ultimately who makes every single thing happen. But we are just to take the means. And when Allah sees us taking the proper means in order to make that thing happen, he may bless us in the way that we want the outcome to come, come about, right? 
But ultimately, it's all up to him. And every single thing is a lesson and not a loss. It's a reminder from Allah. Um, are we good on time for Salah? Oh, yeah. Okay, about nine more minutes. Okay. So, um, after this um, reminder that the brother uh, gives to the disbelieving man. Oh, he also, uh, when he said that, and if you see me as uh, lower than you because I don't have as much money or I don't have as many children or a squad behind me, people who are with me, right? If you don't, if you see me like this, why is it that you are arrogant and you point out my so so-called flaws about the things that Allah has blessed you with that I don't have. And one thing that will help keep us in check regarding this, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in an authentic hadith, إِذَا أَحَدُكُمْ إِذَا نَظَرَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَى مَنْ فُضِّلَا عَلَيْهِ فِي الْمَالِ وَالْخَلْقِ فَلْيَنظُرْ إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ أَسْفَلَ مِنْهُ and so the Prophet Muhammad advises us in a cure for when we're out in this world and we see that people have more than us. Oh, that person drives a really nice Tesla. I just saw a brother with a beautiful car, mashallah. It was a Tesla and it like had the suicide doors. It came out like this and his son hopped out of it and ran into the masjid. I said, mashallah, it was really it was awesome. And may Allah bless and increase that family. But uh, the Prophet reminds us, if you see anyone who has... Uh, more money than you or who uh, may have a better creation than you. Someone is so-called prettier, you feel, or a brother is more handsome or, wow, this person has some really nice height or whatever the case is, uh, you know, especially with scrolling on Instagram and getting caught up in all of the mental games there where we, it's a game of just seeing what everybody else has compared to what we don't, right? The cure for that, uh, the prophet reminds us, is to look at someone who has less than you. And boom, you're snapped right back into reality and therefore you become what? Grateful to Allah, right? When you look at someone, and this can be a little bit funny, and we don't um, put anybody down by this, but if you feel like you're not the most handsome person, there's a lot of people out there who's probably doing worse than you in, in their looks, right? If you feel like you're not the tallest person and you wish to be a baller, like in the NBA, for example, you know what? You might not be in the NBA, you might not be that tall, but guess what? You still got legs and you can still go out and hoop. Because there's people who don't have legs, right? You may be wanting to have more than one child or whatever the case is. Some people can't have children at all. Correct? So the Prophet Muhammad wasallam gives us a, a, a direct medicine that helps us avoid this despairing because things could always be worse things could always be worse and so when we know the words of Allah and his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam will have a cure for every single thing that goes on inside of our lives right and that's the point of these beautiful gatherings and uh, gatherings of dhikr of remembrance because it helps us always constitute and orient and orient ourselves in the direction that Allah Azza wa Jal wants us to face. We'll continue a little bit more before we break for Salah. Uh, and then we'll come back and finish inshallah. But we have about uh, six more minutes. So the brother who had been reminding his companion, this boastful brother, regarding uh, these gardens that he has and his arrogance and saying that, you know, uh, he don't think this will ever end and that he has more money and more people behind him. Let's see what happens. The brother continues and he says, فَعَسَى رَبِّي أَن يُؤْتِيَنِي خَيْرًا مِّن جَنَّتِكَ وَيُرْسِلَ عَلَيْهَا حُسْبَانًا مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتُصْبِحَ صَعِيدًا زَلَقًا أَوْ يُصْبِحَ مَاؤُهَا غَوْرًا فَلَن تَسْتَطِيعَ لَهُ طَلَبًا And so, the brother, the Muslim brother, tries to put things more so into perspective for his brother. Right? Again, we said of how this Muslim man, he could have came down harsh on his brother. He could have said, what? You don't know this? You don't know this about Allah? You behave this way? 
No, he tried to reason with the man in a very justful and dignified type of way to get the brother to think. And he said, so, you know, perhaps, my Lord, with your arrogance and the way that you're speaking and thinking that you're the one who controls and owns everything and all of your success has solely come from you, perhaps, what if Allah gave me goodness from your garden? Allah can end up giving me the goodness from your garden. Uh, Allah can end up giving me goodness for, uh, from your garden. He can also send a thunderbolt down from the sky as he controls everything. And it can shock and hit your gardens and turn it to perpetual dust. To a point where you wouldn't even be able to go and search the wa for the water to even irrigate any more crops or fruits after your whole plantation has been destroyed. Because as the way that he gave it to you, Allah can take it away. Right? And this is what he's trying to convey to, your, to his friend. And also, Allah, the one that you put down, Allah can give him and grace him with much more than what you even had. And now you're sitting there looking what? Foolish. And you had to learn life and a lesson a much more harder way than taking heed. Right? Also being youth. When people speak to us, when people give us advice, there's a reason why Allah has sent that person. For the youth, having parents. Your parents tell you and they convey to you for a reason because they've already lived the life that you have. So also with growing up and being in a state of feeling like no one ever listens to you or no one gets you. Okay, parents, for us too, we got to understand that our youth goes through a certain type of crisis as well. Right. And we got to try to be merciful with them, even in their little er uh, ignorance that they have. Right. And we got to try to reconcile and meet in the middle regarding these things. But we got to try to hear them out. And youth, children, you need to try to do your best to also listen to your parents because they have a wisdom that sometimes we don't have. I'm sorry, that, that you don't have. Right. And so it's important to take heed and to take advice when someone is trying to help you out and the person who is advising you. That's the person who actually loves you. Generally, today we live in a world that is extremely sensitive. Whenever we, we receive some type of criticism, right, they used to call it constructive criticism. Right. Someone critiques me or let me know Oh, when I was speaking, I didn't really connect with the audience. Hey, bro, you didn't really connect. Maybe today, you know, if you memorize a little bit better and you looked at the crowd when you speak, uh, maybe people will feel more connected, for example. Right. Oh, honey. Um, next time, if it just with our dish, if you just added a little bit more salt, it'll be that much more better. Right. Uh, brother, if you just went to the gym, maybe once or twice during the week, man, you, you know. You'd be able to make more tawah, for example, right? So these are the things, but sometimes we get, we don't know how to take criticism, right? And the same for our youth. The same for us sometimes as parents or as a husband or uh, a spouse. Forgive me. The uh, We're about to make salah, so uh, we have to take uh, a quick break, and then we'll come back and finish our story, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, we had uh, been continuing. Uh, well, to continue, we had uh, kind of went off into a little tangent, and that tangent was regarding uh, being able to take criticism and knowing uh, within the story of these. Two uh, archetypes, one who is a boastful person and one who is more so a level-headed person, the Muslim, and the, also the disbeliever, really. Um, we were, again, discussing about uh, taking criticism. Um, one thing that I can remember, uh, which was a really nice way of I saw um, this funny show that uh, my father used to show me. And there's this, tooth, this toothpaste called AIM, right? And so, we're, again, we're discussing about uh, how to take criticism, but also uh, regarding this story, because, again, we're on a tangent, about how to also give criticism in a kind way. And there were these two brothers who would be really funny towards one another, and there's this uh, toothpaste called AIM. 
And so he, uh, his brother came up to him and said, uh, hi, hi, Marlon. Or, hi, Sean. How you doing? And so he smelt his breath and he turned his face and he said, man, did you use AIM? And his brother said, uh, no, I'm sorry. He said, did you, uh, did you brush your teeth? And the brother responded. He said, yeah, I use AIM, right? That's the brand of the toothpaste. He said, well, man, it smelled like you missed. Right. And so these are some of the ways, like uh, some kind ways of how, you know, it depends on who you're talking to, first and foremost, but how to kind of break ice with people. Right. Sometimes we come from relieving ourselves from the restroom and we done made wudu and we done hot and we try to get all the mucus out. And we walk out, got mucus sitting on our beard and the brother will look you in the face and don't even tell you, hey, hey brother, you got some boogers coming out. You know, you probably want to wipe that. Right. But they say the person who criticizes you, the person who can acknowledge something to you and let you know something about yourself is actually the one who cares for you, right? Because you see that person and it, it, it may be something embarrassing, but because of your love for them, you'll tell them. And therefore, that person generally and should uh, be able to take that criticism and therefore we can always better ourselves. So again, this was a little bit of a tangent that we end up um, taking uh, regarding our story of uh, the Muslim man and the boastful gardener. So just to remind the last place that we had been on was the Muslim brother was res uh, responding to his brother of letting him know the one who created you is the one who created your gardens, right? And the one who has blessed you in life and who has given you all of this means that you have, all of this wealth, um, all of these people who are with you because you can take care of them because of your God. He is the one who ultimately blessed you with it, all, with it all. And so you should be thankful and therefore not arrogant within that. So then he also tells him the one who controls your garden, he controls the skies just as well. And he can send a thunderbolt to your garden and he can seize it all. He can take it all. He can also strike it to a sense of where the river that you have growing uh, and coming out of those gardens can also sink down so much inside of the earth that you'd never be able to trace it. You'd never be able to go and get that water. And what do we need in order for uh, gardens to grow is you need water. And this man was blessed with a spring that came from the water, which always made this uh, uh, garden produce year round. Right. But the, the brothers reminding, don't be arrogant about the things that you have. Because the one who is in control of everything can ultimately take it away from you. And so um, finishing this same part, the brother is still advising him. And back to the Quran. وَأُحِيطَ بِثَمَرِهِ فَأَصْبَحَ يُقَلِّبُ كَفَّيْهِ عَلَى مَا أَنْفَقَ فِيهَا وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَى عُرُوشِهَا وَيَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أُشْرِكْ بِرَبِّي أَحَدًا And so Allah describes to us inside of this glorious Quran that it came to pass that this man's uh, wealth, uh, his garden, the river that uh, gushed forth in between this garden was seized by Allah, right? In order to teach this boastful man a lesson. So it came to pass and all this man could do was shake his hands in dismay over his broken heartedness, over his foolishness, over his arrogance, right? How many times have we stepped in life? And maybe our mother or our father has told us to not do something. As we said before, even while we have the uh, children's song, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. Right? One fell off and bumped his head. I, I forget kind of how it goes. Mama called the doctor and the doctor said, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. Why is that? Because somebody was advised to uh, not do that thing. Typically, a parent or someone who has been through something, they're advising that person so they don't have to go through a hard experience, right? And that's the point of love and also being inside of the position that you're in is to rightly try and guide people. And also being the, the subject of that conversation is for you to take heed. These are things that helps us put ourselves into uh, our, our prospective places in life. 
It's when an elder or someone who is in charge of something, when they give a command or ruling or advising us to come back to the middle path, right, is to listen to what they say. Even if it may hurt our feelings, even if it may goes against our arrogance because the nefs, right, those things that are desiring so much is so riled up and just feels like it has so much power. So it feels like it can't be torn down. So when someone tells you, hey, you're being a fear to own, we need you to calm down. You don't respond like fear to own, right? And you don't disregard what the person like Musa is coming to you, trying to advise you. Hey, bro, take it easy. Calm down. Come back to earth. Dad, you're being really mean. You said some really mean things to us. Oh, I should be able to hear my son and listen to him and say, you know what? Maybe I was. Instead of being like, who are you to tell me anything? Or mom, you fussing just a little bit. Can you get off just a little bit? Right. Mother should be able to say, you know what? I am a bit stressed, but let me actually calm down a bit because Allah is the one who gave me this child. Allah is the one who gave me this child and it is up for me. Allah sees what I'm doing right now and I'll be questioned about these things. And I don't want something to happen hard in my life. And so that's why Allah is giving us this example. Right. This person who was boastful and he kept going and he went to the edge. Don't push me. Don't push yourself because you're close to the edge. Y'all, did y'all get that reference? Okay. Anyways, when you keep going perpetually more and more and more of not listening, you'll end up falling off that bed and bumping your head. Right? And so this is the point of why Allah grants us these beautiful stories. Because Allah knows ultimately how the human being is and what our characteristic types are like. And so how magnificent, why, out of all of the things that Allah could have put in his glorious Qur'an to connect, to, for something to resonate with you and I, why this type of story? Because we typically are of these type of archetypes, of characters. So continuing, when the man, he gets dismayed and he says, what have I done? What did, what did I do? I can't believe, look at out of all the money that I put into this garden, out of all the people that I was able to serve and to feed based off of what I have, all of my power is gone. And then he had to come to what? The reality of what he was trying to be advised about before. And he says, وَلَمْ أُشْرِكْ, وَلَمْ أُشْرِكْ the simple thing of what his friend, his peer, a father, a mother, a friend, when they tried to advise him, he didn't take that advice. And he kept pushing through. And then he had to come to, re to the reality. As they say, he had to learn things the hard way. And he recognized and realized that he should have never associated himself as partners to Allah. Because Allah is the one who gives you every single thing it is that you have. And then Allah gives us a message after this, and He tells us, وَلَمْ تَكُلْ لَهُ فِيَتْوِينَ يَمْسُرُونَهُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَمَا مِنْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَمَا كَانَ مُنْتَصِرًا And Allah says, do not become like this man. Allah reminds us and warns us to not become like this person. He says that, there is no, a uh, afiatun is like a group, uh, like a rescue group. Could you imagine when we get in trouble in this life and things are strenuous on us and whether it's bills to pay, the children are driving you crazy, um, you're fearful of anything. So you feel like you're out in the ocean all by yourself, just drifting. And so you realize that it's just you and Allah. Now imagine... Right. In today's time, we have uh, what they call rescue teams who come inside of a helicopter and save you. But Allah says there's nothing. There's no thing in the earth that can save you, oh human being, except Allah. So how needy are we in actuality? Even being able to be rescued. Right. Even if we were out in that ocean and a rescue team were to come. 
It is only by the will of Allah that Allah allowed for you to be noticed, to get help. And that is Allah who actually helped you even through that rescue team. So we must always be able to put things in their proper perspectives going forth in life. And this is the last uh, ayah of our beautiful story. Um, and uh, just to continue, just to make sure I said this part. And Allah also says, وَمَا كَانَ مُنْتَلْسِرَ And there was nobody there to aid this man, right, except for Allah. So even when things seem like um, you having a problem and no one can help you in your despair, right? It, it doesn't matter who you go and talk to about your issue of what you're going through in life. There's no one who can make any difference in what it is that you're going through. You solely feel the way that you feel about it. Have you turned to Allah regarding your situation? Have you pleaded to Allah the way that you would plead to others about whatever issue it is that you have inside of your life? Have you take the time out the way that you will complain to a parent, to a friend, to anyone? Go online and type ways that you feel. Have you took the time out to actually do that with your Lord before someone else? So Allah is also showing us about having to welcome in Him, which is having trust in Him regarding the things that we go through. And lastly, the last verse Allah says, هُنَالِكَ الْوَلَايَةُ لِلَّهِ الْحَقِّ هُوَ خَيْرٌ ثَوَابًا وَخَيْرٌ عُقُبًا And Allah says that these narrations, they are true, right? And they have a resounding meaning for you and I to pick up on. He is the most rewarding and He is the one who gives. So... Alhamdulillah, that has been our majalis and our talk regarding today between the boastful gardener and the Muslim. And now this will be the time for any Q&A, uh, any epiphanies or aha moments or anything that you would like to share. Please, the floor is open because as we mentioned before, and I, uh, some of you are also new to the group, and so you probably couldn't hear the gist of uh, this story from the glorious Quran. Um, but if there's anything regarding this story, or even not, please share because we have the floor for about 20 more minutes. And again, when you share, uh, we all get to benefit. So please speak up if you have anything that you'd like to share. It doesn't have to deal with the story. It could. It doesn't have to. It can be anything. But would anybody like to share? The mic's, the wife's, the mic's working? Okay, great. Is there anything that anybody would like to share regarding the story? Is there anything that anybody maybe have picked up or realized? Is anybody familiar with this story inside the glorious Quran? Okay, I guess we're going to sit here and do this. Is anybody going to share? No. I know some of y'all thinking, I know the hearts are like, yeah, I want to share something, but I don't know. I might sound a little bit weird. You got something to share? Come on, you got something to share. Anybody got something? We want to hear from you guys. Yes. Uh, the microphone right there behind you. Yes, yeah, so um, I kind of was not here the whole time of the thing, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe nobody has something to share. <laughs> maybe I can ask a question. Please. Yes. I have kids as well, so sometimes I, I'm i just, you know, one is how to respect your parents, but on the contrary, how can, um, I mean, I know this might be a deep question, but if you want to give a simple answer, I'd appreciate it. It's just, what is the, because I know I want to teach my kids about the dean and so forth, mm -hmm. but I haven't got that far to understand the okay. meaning of what a parent's responsibility is mm. towards their child. MashaAllah. Okay. Okay, I can. I feel like I can help shed a little bit of light on that, inshallah. So our dear brother has asked, and um, I'm going to rephrase the question just to make sure I've said it correctly, okay? I'm make sure I'm understanding. So our brother has said that uh, he has children. And so are you saying that you're new to Islam as well? No, no, oh, okay. No, no. You, okay, alhamdulillah. So... Uh, with having children, how to first I heard about like uh, 
respecting your parents, but also your position as a parent and how to actually be with your children. Is is this? Yeah, or obligation. Or obligation. Oh, yeah. As a parent. Okay, because, obligations. You know, I know I want to teach them regarding Dean. Mm. Of course, they have to do this a lot. And okay, so okay, I got so you. On. Okay, I got is you. Is that the fine line, at least I feel comfortable that I've done my part? Mm -hmm. Yes. That line. Okay, okay, so what is that line? Well, that line is, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a few technicalities, but we're going to keep it simple, okay? And just brother to brother advice from what um, I've learned since being on my journey of studying, being around great men and women who have led and set and a great example through the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So firstly, what I would advise you is knowing and getting to know the life of the Prophet Muhammad Because we get to get uh, really the inside scoop on how he وسلم, was. And this is the best way to uh, be, obviously, right? It's following the footsteps of the greatest of creation. And that is the Prophet Muhammad So when you know what he would do, and the more conscious you are of what he did, right? You will start to try to implement those things into your life. And so as they say, monkey see, monkey do, right? And so when your children see it coming from you, because they don't say uh, monkey say, monkey do, right? You know, especially being a vice gerent, a caretaker of anything, people are more prone to respond off of your actions other than your words, right? And that's how children really pick up on things. So, for example, and not saying that you do this, but if you say, Children, you guys got to be up for Fajr, for Fajr, and you need to make Salah on time, and you need to call the Azan, right? But if you never, if we never set that example, if we don't ever do it, and we expect it to get done because we told them, they don't have any type of model to copy after. So your not doing of the action gives them a confirmation that they don't have to do it either, no matter what comes out from the mouth, right? So the, I've learned the more that I've sat with these people, that I've been around these people, and they are men and women of action, and they do the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that's where you have success at. And I've been able to see that within my household just from when I uh, hadn't been studying to when I started studying and I was implementing it and seeing it with my child, uh, alhamdulillah. So that would be my advice in short is doing the... So um, I love to connect it to like, uh, we love sports, right? And so we have this uh, great debate. Who was the greatest NBA player of all time? Right? Or for the our sisters too, they could put it, somebody sneezed and said, Kobe? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but um, uh, or even for our sisters, um, you can juxtapose this same type of idea, right? But let's just say, for example, a lot of people say Michael Jordan, right? And so, what is it when you look at Michael Jordan, if you want to be the best baller, you're going to do every single thing Michael Jeffrey Jordan did. You see how I even know his middle name, for example, right? So you're going to know something about him. You're going to know where he comes from. You're going to know uh, what he eats, the way that he trains, the way that he dress, what he does. You're constantly uh, in knowledge about this person because they're the greatest in their field of what they do. Right. Because I want to be like this particular person, I'm going to do everything to mimic them. Right. So when we are able to juxtapose our minds and our hearts about what is the point of us being on this earth, we will juxtapose ourselves to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and say, how is it that I can be the best, the greatest human being that I can possibly be? And that's by following the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and that's by getting to know him. And so the more that you get to know him, you have references about how to act and react in whatever situation that you're in. And therefore, you know, as Allah is pleased with his messenger, Allah will be pleased with you. Alhamdulillah. I hope that that answers the question. I, I couldn't, uh, I didn't want to give something that was even more like short or terse because uh, a lot of it is just whatever we can do to connect with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran. I know as cliche as it may sound, but the more that you are around good company and you see good parents, you get ideas on how to do that. Like, for example, I saw one of my teachers, man, like his son was acting out. And from the culture that we like come from, 
that we were taught, especially being raised up in Oakland, like the, your parents are just used to like, what well, they heard something bad, you're going to get a whooping. All right. And so, but the prophet peace be upon him wasn't like this with his children. And so when I was inside of this house, like the kid, he raised his voice to his father and the father's like a chef, right? But the way that he did, like he just came to the boy, he spoke gently to him and he hugged him and a little boy just melted. And he was able to just be, uh, the father was able to speak to him, to tell him about what was uh, wrong about what he did. The little boy was able to understand. And it just switched things from like, it had, I almost cried looking at it. Because when you don't have the right example, but then you see this person with this nur because they're practicing this prophetic character inside of their household. And you get to witness that. Now it gives you a direct, like, oh, he's the Jordan of Muslims. Right. I want to be like that. Right. And so I want to. How can I be like Muhammad? Not like Mike, but like Muhammad. Right. And so that's these are the type of things. So when you surround yourself also with really good company and those who lead a righteous life and you can do whatever you can to get around them, it'll rub off on you. Right. There's a hadith that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, tells us about the uh, I didn't memorize this one yet, but I've, I've heard it plenty of times about the. Uh, one who makes perfume and the blacksmith, right? And so the blacksmith who hammers and beats that metal and whatnot, they'll come back home smelling like iron and ore, and that uh, smell from being around them will eventually get to you and affect you. But imagine being around the perfumist, right? The one who smells extremely beautiful because they've been around roses and beautiful flowers and whatnot all day. And so imagine what type of effect that that would uh, have on you just uh, due to fragrance from being around them. Right. So we want to do our best to surround ourselves with good company because that's how we will become. And you, it, there's no way that you can help it because you got a good example. So that would be the answer to that about how to lead children. And, and again, the first thing would be monkey see, monkey do. Thanks, brother. I appreciate uh, it. And I think that was a best answer. I was my question was more so that, hey, um, is there a set kind of. Ob like you know obligation that you can do but that that example the way you gave mm -hmm. I think is so universal that truly even as cliche as it is uh, it applies Alhamdulillah thank you and even besides this we could talk uh, more besides that but I just also don't want to when we kind of talk about technical things like from a thick standpoint right about like what you are actually just obliged to do there's a lot. There can be some gray areas in that, and that can kind of mislead people. So being in the gathering, too, uh, I just want to also make sure we give something that is digestible for people. But we can still have a conversation besides that, inshallah. inshallah. Is there anything else anybody would like to ask, to add, um, to please share? Because it would truly benefit us. Is there anything that you picked up from the class, maybe? Is there anything that you would like to maybe start working on your own selves? Um, how about uh, I'll put myself on the guillotine? Let me think. Um, regarding myself, there's a lot that um, I would like to work on and that I learned a lot from uh, this story of the Quran. And I would say, uh, as Sheikh Hamza Yusuf calls it, is um, is like this spiritual monotony, which is uh, getting used to doing something over and over and over and over again and it may be boring but to where you become refined and that thing becomes good and sweet for you right so for myself i would say what i learned from this um is trying to stay in the best state that i can be of like the level-headed muslim inside of this story right so uh there came a time where this man and it's called the man is called a disbeliever actually who was being very boastful and arrogant but look, if we look at how the Muslim responded to this arrogant person who put him down, who told him that you don't have as many children as me, you don't have as much power as me, you don't have any wealth. Actually, you don't have any kids, right? Uh, I don't believe in what you believe, yet look at everything that I have. Do you understand Like, how much would that infuriate one of us if someone was talking down to us? And look at the way that this man responded to this disbelieving person. And he still gently reminded him, right? Because he still knows Allah is the one who is in control of all affairs. So whether him being poor and not having much as this disbelieving person doesn't mean that he's a loser. Ultimately, when you have faith in Allah, you are the ultimate winner 
no matter how much you have or don't have. And so I would like to just sharing with you guys. I would like to be a person who can respond to criticism, as we mentioned earlier, too. I would like to be a person who can respond to criticism with wisdom, who can uh, forbear uh, certain things that may be hurt, who when a child comes to him and uh, vents maybe their frustration or the same for a wife or anything that I can respond in a way that is pleasing to Allah every single time. So that's something that I've learned from this story, alhamdulillah, and something that I'd like to take and uh, impart inside of my life. Uh, maybe this may help, uh, may have helped you all think about something, but we would love if you guys shared something that, uh, you know, that you may have picked up from the story. If not, that's okay. But again, the more that you sh uh, share, the more benefit that we all receive, inshallah. Is there anything that anybody would like to share before our time is up? We've got just a few more minutes. Was the, was the story at least comprehensive? Did you get, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Did you find it? Was the story interesting? Okay, well, so what, we're hope, what we hope to do is, inshallah, is learn to, that these great stories are in the glorious Quran, right? And these are the greatest of stories. No matter who produces what movie, uh, what station that things come on, Netflix, Roku, whatever the case is, Allah has given us the best of stories. And if we learn to connect ourselves to the stories of Allah, We'll find deep meanings every single time, no matter how many times we recite them and read them. As long as you look for it, Allah will bless you with meanings and understandings of his glorious stories. And they are the best of any story that has ever been given in life, in history. So when we look at it like that, uh, we'll be able to engage, love more and connect with the glorious Quran that much more and derive much more benefit, inshallah. But um, I guess that's going once. Going twice. No one wants the microphone. Anything? Young man, you got something to share? Yeah, you. Did you pick up on anything? Can you? Could you go back home and teach something about this lesson to someone in your family? Huh? I missed most of it. Oh, you did? Uh, but you, what about some of it? What about the some of it that you did pick up? Oh, no. <laughs> it's okay. What's your name? Amar. Um, Ammar? Yes. MashaAllah, beautiful name. Is that like with an ayn in the beginning? Do you know? Ammar. Yeah, okay. I think I see how to spell it. I think it's ayn, meme, and the raw, right? Ammar. MashaAllah, that's a beautiful name. We have a teacher uh, with that beloved name. That's a really, really beautiful name, actually. Mm -hmm. I named after Ammar bin Yasser. MashaAllah. MashaAllah, what a what a beautiful name. Alhamdulillah. Does any anybody else have anything? Please. What's up, man? You wanna share something? I know you wanna share something. What's your name? Fahid? Fahid. Where are you from? Indonesian. What's up with your brother? I was around a lot of Indonesian brothers back in Tarim. So I'm pretty familiar with uh, your culture a little bit in the food. It's really good stuff, man. Is there anything you want to share? Did you pick up something? You can share. Come on, bless us with something, please. Here's a microphone. Anything that comes to the heart. And I think you came a little bit later, too. And so, uh, we're happy to have you a part of this. Uh, I think, like, it was just about the, the parenting thing that actually like, kind of stood up. Like, even though mm. I'm not a parent, I just, like, I just want to, like, it was, like, Interesting to know. Hmm. What about though being a child? You know, of uh, if you do, you have parents. Yeah. Okay, alhamdulillah. But what about being a child and the way that you feel like uh, you should be toward your parents? Let me give you something. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has told us, "Ahabul a'amali ilallahi." Um, the most beloved uh, actions um, uh, to Allah. Is um, so, uh, liwaktiha, meaning praying the salah in its appropriate time, thumma birrul walidain, which is uh, having this uh, uh, respect and obedience towards the parents, thumma thumma jihadu fi sabilillah, then striving and struggling in the way of Allah, meaning if you have any type of, uh, let's say, if someone has. 
um, uh, a vice or uh, what is it called? Like when you're addicted to something and you know it may be wrong to be doing, but you strive to overcome it. You try to put barriers between yourself and that thing that you maybe go back to, right? This is doing jihad fi sabili la. Uh, doing jihad fi sabili la is knowing that, you know what? I'm supposed to respect my parents, but they get on my nerves. And I know that I can respond in a good way right now, but I'm not. Right? No. Doing jihad is responding in the best way and overcoming the nefs. So, to translate that, the second one was thumma birrul walidain, which is respecting and loving and being obedient to your parents as best as you can. Right? And so, these are the most beloved of actions to Allah. And so what about just like being a child who has parents? Does this story make you reflect on uh, in a way of like how you can be maybe even better towards them? Um, I, I missed most of the story. I, I just came today. Uh, okay. So um, I don't know much about the story. Okay, maybe you might catch it next time, inshallah. Or you can catch it on your local YouTube station on MCC. <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. Brother, I'm going to get you too. You came a little late too, didn't you? Okay. Yeah, I just, um, you know, just share something. Yes, please. Well, like, I remember when I was younger, and I come from an environment where we respect our parents. I'm from Afghanistan. Mm, background. Mashallah. And so, you know, every parent that comes respect. I come from that kind of. So you keep the mic a little closer to you oh. so everyone can. Yep, yep. There you go. So, so I did come from that kind of environment, and alhamdulillah, I'm very grateful for my parents and so forth. But I, I did have some friends when I was younger, and they were complaining about their parents, mm. their mom, and mm. so forth. Mm. And I remember, and I told them, I shared with them one thing that they were very happy they did. So at that time, we didn't have that much money on us mm. as youngsters. Mm. But I did tell them, I was like, hey, my brother, like, I advise you instead of being on the bad side of your mom, let's go to the dollar store even mm. and get like some like they had like little beanies and gloves and awesome. a scarf. Uh -huh. I was like, spend three bucks, uh -huh. brother, and let's just put that in something and take it to your mom. Awesome. You know? Yeah. And he's like, bro, I don't want to do this. Mm. You know? Mm. I encourage them. Just do it for me, for my side. You yeah. know, like I tried to help him as a friend. Awesome. And he when he did it. He realized that it was a very good effect mm. on his relationship with his mom. Mashallah. So even though he wasn't in the best of state mm. with his mom, but sometimes even though if even it doesn't make sense to, yeah. if you spill that See? and you know, and you do that kind of action, I, I realized that it was a very good outcome. And That's I, right. And I, I felt even very happier too as a friend. <laughs> Mashallah. <laughs> and see, this is this is just a blessing of Islam and the ni'mah. Just a few of the things that, uh, a few of the many things that Allah Azza wa Jalla has blessed us with, and that's having good companionship. And so sometimes when you're in a difficult situation where maybe our arrogance is the forefront of our response to a certain type of situation just as you mentioned their friend was like nah, whatever my mom she's acting like this i ain't about to do nothing for her right but he overcame something took some advice we spoke about uh, criticism right he was able to listen to some feedback and say you know what let me just try now let me pass up my ego i'm gonna respond in a better way that allah actually will like for me and look majority of the times I would even go to say 100% of the time something good will end up coming out when you forego the ego and you try to mend in better relationships, right? Instead of always standing on the principle that, no, someone wronged me, so therefore I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z. There's another story that we actually told uh, before this that you guys are reminding me of in the Quran, but um, that's really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that for us. Um, if... It, if uh, Come on, man. You can share some, a little bit of some. What's your name, brother? Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman, mashallah, man. I thought she was Mexican. <laughs> that, that's what a lot of people say. They do. <laughs> <laughs> mashallah, I just came back from Mexico. I was ready to speak to you in Spanish a little bit, man. But okay, Abdurrahman, mash, 
Oh. <laughs> Learn Spanish, just like people. Ah, okay, yeah, you you you'd be pretty good, yeah. man. Um, but are you from here? Uh, yeah. Mashallah. Is there anything that it doesn't have to be again related to the story? But if so, I know that you said you came a bit late too and you missed out. But is there anything that you would like to just share? Is there anything about this halakha, like um, just our gathering of remembrance, the, that makes you feel any type of way? Yeah, from the summary that you gave me uh, of the story. Bring it up a little bit closer to you. From, from the summary you gave me of the story mm. and the, the last part that you shared. Um, like giving criticism nowadays is mm. difficult because nowadays people take it with, like people are sensitive with it. Yeah. So there's a specific way you have to give it to them, especially depending on like the personality of that person. And uh, I, I go to a public school where there's not a lot of Muslims. Mm. So the things that they do, you know, it's it's kind of a corrupt system nowadays. Mm. So giving that criticism to these people, to like, I don't yeah. want to say these people. I know. I, I understand what you're yeah. saying. I understand. What you're but giving, those, giving that criticism is difficult. Because, and may Allah bless you for being gentle. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Giving, those, giving that criticism to... Um, People that do these things mm -hmm. is difficult because they take it with a. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, it's they like, take it highly yeah. offensive. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the time that we live in. Subhanallah. Um, you're right. And um, just before we close up, I think a lot of that has to deal with obviously the day and the age that we live in. The more and more we get closer to Yom Al um, there are just specific things that are going to happen, but. It's up for you and I to be strong and our uh, never uh, relenting to becoming the norm of what the society is doing, right? So as long as you are firm on the principles that you have and stepping in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad and following Allah, then your, uh, your example as we kind of been, this whole thing been going around, right? This monkey see monkey do will eventually have a certain type of effect on someone, right? Even if it's one person, we've done we've done good, right? And so I understand exactly what you're saying, but I think a lot of that has to deal with uh, things like the internet, for example. And when we're on such a, uh, a a climate now where everybody has an opinion, everybody can be heard. So now. How much more scrutiny are you able to be subscribed to now, right? Like if the whole, if you can post a picture and the whole world can see it, now the whole world can comment on that picture, right? So therefore, uh, it also stops. It has this blockade between it of actual real connection with people. So now when you read a comment, you're not hearing the words from people, right? How many times have someone ever texted someone and things are taken fully out of context? Right. Like someone may be reading your your whatever you're saying to them in much more of an offensive type of way. Like uh, you can say, uh, for example, like your wife can text you or I know you guys are really young or a friend or whatever the case. But I'll just give an example. Of, right. Of the wife, for example, like you can text. Uh, uh, she can say, hey, honey, what's the food grade? And you can text back. Yes. Right. <laughs> but yes, you probably was like, yes. For example, right? You like yes, but she's probably he just read it like yes, right? And so she she's reading something that she's comprehending something in her head much more differently than how it actually was. You come back home and now there's an issue, correct? Because there's this miscommunication because there wasn't this actual human connection to where you can actually hear tone, which is extremely important for human beings to know kind of how things are being communicated, right? You can tell, you can walk into a shop somewhere, someone can speak a different language, but you can tell if someone is actually mad or if they're saying something kind to someone else based off of tone, right? And so a lot of things get lost in translation because of these obstacles and barriers that we kind of have in between one another. And so, uh, man, that's a really good thing that you brought up and something that we was able to benefit. So, uh, you're Abdul Rahman. Thank you so much for sharing. And sorry, you guys, this has been our time for tonight. I don't want to hold you guys anymore and make you guys feel uh, obliged. But so we'll just uh, end with a closing dua. We ask that Allah forgives us of our sins and our wrongdoings. Uh, we ask that Allah guides us to the straight path. We ask that Allah blesses um, our teachers 
and everyone who has facilitated for this uh, gathering of remembrance to commence. We um, ask Allah to relieve our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering, those in Philistine and the West Bank and the Gaza. We ask Allah to alleviate our brothers and sisters who are starving, even in, that, in, in those areas of the world, in the Horn of Africa, in Sudan, in Somalia, and so on and so forth. We ask that Allah relieves the Ummah of uh, the fitting that is uh, going on. And we ask Allah to safeguard us and make us thabit, make us firm in this deen of his and to love his glorious Quran and to love his messenger. May Allah inculcate within inside of our hearts the love of Allah and his messenger. Say ameen, ameen. May Allah uh, direct every single muscle fiber, every single neuron, every single atom in our body to want to do everything to please him. His self and to please his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say ameen ameen ya rabbal alameen Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min al-jahannam wa min wa min azab al-qabri wa min wa min azab al-mahya wa al-mamati wa min fitna al-masih al-dajjal wa min al-maghrami wa al-ma'athami Allahumma gfir lana ma qaddamna wa ma akharna وما أصرفنا وما أسررنا وما أعلنا وما أنت علم به منا أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك. And we just said that oh Allah we ask you <coughs> your protection from uh, the punishment of the hellfire oh Allah say I mean oh Allah we seek refuge in you from the punishment of uh, uh, the the cover of the the life of the grave. Oh Allah, we ask you to relieve us from punishment of anything that is harmful on this earth that can happen to our bodies, our minds, our souls. Oh Allah, we ask you to guide us to the straight path. We ask you to relieve us of the trials and the fitna of the Jal, the Antichrist, the the fake one who will eventually come. Oh Allah. And for everything that you know about us, everything that you see, every secret that we have, every wrong action that we've done in secrecy and public, oh Allah, the things that we have wasted, we ask that you forgive us of that, for you are the one who sees all things. And we return back to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And we should say in closing, Surah Al Fatiha. يا كن عبود وإيا كن استعين إهدينا صراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعت عليهم وخير الطيب عليهم الطالب هذه